This last bit um, is going to be looking at staff wellbeing and we're going to be considering a research project that was done 10 years ago. Okay, um, and it was done 10 years ago really because the government um, had another piece of research done looking at the economy and the biggest threat to the economy was mental, mental well-being. Um, so they decided to do another research project looking into that. Has anyone heard of the five ways to well-being? We have a couple people. Excellent. Now, I think the stress less um, take five was probably um, based on this. So there, there are some trusts that have that took the five ways to well-being and developed it and implemented it within the trust. Um, so the five ways to well-being um, are connect, be active, take notice, keep learning and give. And we're going to look over those. So it isn't rocket science, but as we heard um, from Dick in this morning, um, when it comes to putting these five very simple things into practice, it's it gets very tricky. So there is this 10 year research to practice gap. Um, it was the Foresight Mental Capital and Wellbeing Project uh, that was set up to advise the government and the private sector on how to achieve the best possible mental development and wellbeing for everyone in the UK. And they, they commissioned the new Economics Foundation um, to develop a set of evidence-based actions that improve personal well-being. So the New Economics Foundation, this is um, going off on a tangent here, but they have also done a research project into well-being in the workplace. Um, and if you go onto their website, um, you can download that. And there is a, well, uh, a really good well-being tool um, that you can download from that website. But getting back onto the topic, um, so before we think about um, well-being, I think it's quite good just to ha familiarise ourselves with, with some of the terminology because different organisations understand the terminology and differently and it's quite good if we have a consensus on what we mean by things. So mental capital is defined as the totality of an individual's cognitive and emotional resources. And mental well-being is um, a dynamic state which, um, in which the individual is able to develop their potential, work productively, build positive relationships and contribute to their community. The concept of well-being comprises of two main elements. One is feeling good and the other is functioning well. Feeling good is about experience, experiencing happiness, contentment, enjoyment, curiosity, engagement in life. Functioning well is about experiencing positive relationships, having some control over one's life and having a sense of purpose. And the first study in the UK to measure well-being estimated that only 14% of the adult population has a high level of well-being, which they referred to as flourishing. Further studies with children have, have um, used the term thriving. So, but flourishing and thriving are un, uh, uh, sort of understood in the same way. So... The first one is to connect. And I'll let you read through the slide. So we are to think of connecting as the cornerstones of our life. And we are to invest time in developing them. And we are to try and build these connections. Um, these connections will support and enrich our life every day. So... A lot of us here might think connecting, yeah, we all do that. But what we need to keep in mind is how difficult that can be if you have a mental health problem. If you have anxiety and social phobia, connecting 
is going to be really tricky. If you are on the autistic spectrum, then you may struggle with the emotional literacy, you may not see the point in connecting. If you have speech and language problems, just going up and saying hello might be a very daunting experience. Just getting your words out might be really tricky. As teachers, um, you are connecting a lot every day and connecting with people's distress can leave us feeling challenged and drained. And sometimes too many contacts can make us feel as if we're not properly connected to anybody at all. So when we talk about connecting, we usually think of connecting with people, but there are other ways of connecting. There's, it's really important to find time to connect with ourselves, to have that time to meditate or to, or to reflect, keep a personal journal. Connecting with nature, um, with a pet, um, or with animals. A lot of people say that walking their dog um, keep, helps keep them sane. It gives them that time. Um, it forces them to take that time um, and gives them something else to connect with which is going to give rather than be taking. And of course we are beginning to understand um, the importance of connecting with our spiritual needs. On this note, it's important to, um, there are important differences between making contact, connecting and colliding. Um, and connecting, as I've said, it requires emotional literacy and it requires social understanding. And if you're a, a young person that's had traumatic early experiences, if you're a young person with attachment difficulties, then your trust and faith in connecting is going to be somewhat damaged and it's going to be more difficult for you and you're going to have to have a lot more courage to, um, to do the connecting. But life goals associated with a commitment to family, friends, social and political involvement, we know that they promote life satisfaction. In contrast, life goals associated with career success, material gains, are detrimental to life satisfaction. And I can't remember what talk it was, um, I think it was Dickon, that showed that there's been a change. Um, so that's interesting that our young people are catching on to this. Strong social relationships are important because they support, they encourage, they give our life meaning. It's important to have those superficial relationships because they give us a sense of connectedness, um, familiarity and, self, and our self-worth is associated with an individual's position within a community. So if English isn't your first language, then feeling connected to your local community might be more, more difficult. Um, and we need to be considering um, for ourselves, but also within the schools that we're in and the pupils that we come across, every single barrier that they have in terms of connecting and thinking creatively about how we can overcome those. So we need to make sure that we give time and help families to strengthen and broaden their social networks. And we know now with all the neuroscience that um, that when we are well connected, we're releasing oxytocin, which is our bonding chemical. So that's the lovely chemical that you have when you have that baby um, and you're holding it and you're snuggling it closely. But it's a chemical that we need, that all of us need throughout our life. Um, and we get it th through connecting more broadly. Crying and laughing with friends releases endorphins, which is the chemical that helps us power through our difficulties. So if we want to keep on keeping on, we need to make sure that we've got friends to laugh and cry with. So the second one is being active. So we all know that exercise makes us feel good. It's just difficult sometimes getting our bums off the sofa and, and doing it. Um, most importantly, we need to discover, discover a physical activity that we enjoy um, and one that suits our level of mobility and fitness. I am um, at Easter time I signed up to do a marathon um, 
and my husband laughed at me. Um, and sure enough, I had to take my name off of that and I've had to reconsider how, how far my first running challenge is and make it a bit more achievable. So when we think about activity and we think about our school communities, we need to make sure that the activity that we have on offer suits everyone, not just the fit kids. We want the obese kids. We want them to love being active. We want the kids that are couch potatoes, that just sit and game all the time. We want to get them engaging in physical activity and, and being excited by it and thrilled by it and releasing those um, positive, happy chemicals that make them want to do it again. We know that physical activity reduces rates of depression and anxiety in all age groups. And physical activity um, for mild to moderate depression, research has shown that it is just as effective um, within the adult population as antidepressants. And certainly with young people who metabolise antidepressants differently and antidepressants aren't quite so effective for them, we need to be thinking of alternatives. And, and physical exercise is a really good alternative that we need to be thinking very creatively about. So it benefits us because it provides an, increased, an increase in our perceived self-efficacy. It provides us with a sense of mastery, a perceived ability to cope, um, and a distraction from negative thoughts. And we see this, don't we? We see this in our schools. The kids that are engaged with sport, the kids that are engaged in, say, football programmes or um, that are on the hockey team or the netball team, um, they, they generally seem to be more resilient. And so we, so we need to think about how we can make that possible for everybody. It releases endorphins. So again, we've covered that. I'm sure you've all heard of runner's high. But just stretching, doing yoga releases endorphins. And as I've said before, it's the chemical which helps us power through difficulties, helps us keep on keeping on. So the next thing is to take notice. So um, this has become quite fashionable, I think. And Dickon has talked about being curious. And if you can combine activity with connectedness and taking notice, you're covering all three in, in one go. That's got to be good, especially if time's an, uh, an issue. So reflecting on our experiences helps us to appreciate what matters to us. But if you've got ADHD or attention difficulties, then taking notice is going to be a massive challenge, isn't it? Um, Research has shown that being trained to be aware of sensations, thoughts and feelings for eight to 12 weeks um, enhances well-being. So they're talking about mindfulness here. Um, what I would say about mindfulness is it's not something that you can just sort of dip in and out of. The, the, to have a good, uh, the evidence base is good if you f do a programme and you do it properly. Um, and the PSHE service provide training in that. So if that's something you're interested in, um, you can catch them at the back there. So knowing how to be mindful, which is the state of being attentive to and aware of what is taking place in the present, helps us to notice what we're feeling, to regulate our behavior and to become more reflective. This is something that kids with ADHD really need to learn. In fact, when you're a teenager and you're very impulsive anyway, it's something that all teenagers need to learn. If we can be mindful, it enables us to make wiser choices with better consequence, consequences. We're not in this constant um, reactive mode where react, we're reacting in the moment, making impulse decisions which perhaps have poor consequences, suffering the consequences which then perhaps affects, affects our self-esteem, 
um, and then has a knock-on effect on mental health. It's really well documented that young people with ADHD are at significant risk and are very vulnerable to mental health problems. In my experience, usually because they get caught into making impulsive decisions and, and then have to suffer the consequences continually. <coughs> the fourth one is to keep learning. Um, which you guys are all doing, you're here today. But we want to have um, our school environments to be ones where learning isn't just about league tables and GCSEs and exam results, that learning um, is a skill that, that all, of, all of us um, embrace. And it doesn't need to be something with a measured outcome. It can just be um, fixing a bike. So when we're learning new things, we feel more confident. And hopefully what we're learning is fun. So participation in lifelong learning improves our well-being and resilience by increasing our sense of self-esteem, self-efficacy, purpose, hopefulness, competence. Um, and the two young people who were here this morning, Zander and Charlotte, and certainly I think if you were to speak to Amanda from the Prue, um, we, need to, we need to meet our young people where they're at um, and find out if they have got significant mental health problems, find out what is it that they want to learn or they feel they need to, need to learn um, at the moment, because it might not be working towards that GCSE, it might be cooking a meal for themselves. Um, and the last one is to give. Um, and if you're in the teaching profession, you're in a profession that's all about giving. So you can tick that box. So, Seeing yourself and your happiness linked to the wider community can be incredibly rewarding and will create connections with the people around you. As a nurse, you know, I work for the NHS and um, I ha my sister is also a nurse and she is a Macmillan nurse and she works at her local hospice. And within her community, everybody thinks that she's a wonderful angel. Um, when you tell people you're a CAMS nurse, they don't, you don't quite inspire that reaction from them. So she certainly feels a very valued member of her community. And sometimes it's hard to be giving um, if the organisation you're representing doesn't, um, isn't held in very high esteem. Um, so it's good, I think, for schools to think about their reputation and think about and celebrate. We need to celebrate what we're doing well, don't we? So giving, so there's been um, research into actions for happiness. Has anyone heard of that piece of research? I reckon that piece of research must be quite well known because I, in the last three years, the amount of people that let you out you know when you're in a queue of traffic and somebody lets you out? It used to be nobody would let you out, but now I think people let you out and then they tick that. That's my, that's my good deed for the day. They can feel good about that. Um, well, we only have to do one act of kindness once a week over a six-week period and we have an increase in well-being. Isn't that wonderful? Once a week, let a car out. So the evidence suggests that notions of reciprocity and giving back to others um, promotes well-being for people of all, all ages. So in our schools, in our communities, we need to be thinking about um, how our young people can give back. Um, and I know that um, Bottisham, when they presented, um, they talked about the peers, using the peers. So the year 11s um, giving to the year 7s. Um, and that's lovely. And it may be that we want to think about setting up parent groups where parents who've been through difficult experiences can help, um, just help mentor or take the hand of um, 
parents who are really struggling, who perhaps got a young person that's, that they've only just discovered is self-harming. So we need to be thinking about how, how can we have communities um, that, are that are giving? And we need to think about this in a really creative way and include everybody. And there's a virtuous cycle of improving well-being and increasing mental capital. So the well-being actions, and interestingly, I'll just go off on a little tangent here, nutrition and working um, were identified along with these other five actions for improving our well-being, but they didn't um, take up nutrition as an action because it, healthy eating is already um, well established. Um, and they took up the working in their the project on um, well-being in the workplace. Um, so they took that up separately. But I just thought I'd throw that in there for you. So well-being actions play an essential role in satisfying our basic needs for positive relationships, autonomy, comp competency, and security. So whatever, when we are seeking um, to help people, we need to do it in a way that promotes positive relationships, that gives the young person and the parents as much choice as possible. Because none of us like being told what to do, do we? And we certainly don't like going to meetings and being given an action by a colleague um, who's supposed to be your friend. Um, you know, just because you were late or you didn't, or, or you weren't there. Um, so the actions are designed to promote their own positive feedback loops. Giving, for example, giving by doing something nice for someone will generally, generally provoke a thank you, um, which will increase a feeling of satisfaction and the likelihood of us doing something nice for someone again. We like doing nice things and, being, and having that recognised, don't we? Um, so all of the actions are designed um, in that way. So having positive emotions changes how we think and behave. It comes back to what Dickon was saying about those neural networks and um, the, the rivers will find the, um, what did he call them, troughs. Um, so when we have positive emotions, the more positive emotions we have, the, the larger the sort of trough we're, um, we're providing um, to re-experience those emotions again. So positive emotions change how we think and how we behave. It, they enhance our optimism and our resilience and they wire our brain to increase our capacity to feel those emotions again, makes the trough wider and more quickly. Do we get that? Excellent. Okay. So this is, the, um, this is it in a little diagram. So part of why I chose to talk about this is in my 18 years of um, working within CAMS teams, I felt really gutted at having a young person perhaps wait an entire year for an intervention that was not rocket science. An intervention that was basically what I've just told you. An intervention that was essentially looking at these five different areas and thinking about them and thinking about how, the, how we could improve or increase the young person's ability within that. So if they were depressed, how can we, how can, how can I help, how can they, how can others help them to step by step become more active. Um, or if they were socially anxious, the thing that they were avoiding doing which was, was socialising and that's exactly what they needed to start doing again. Um, eating disorders, the thing that they're not doing is eating properly and the thing they need to do is eat properly. So it's sort of taking the myth out of um, the magic of the treatment intervention. It's, it, there's nothing magical about it. It is very common sense and all of you here can, can do it.
So, the five ways to well-being, you've heard of them now. I know a big teaching thing is to say what you're going to say, say it and then say it again. So if you want to put your hand up, so we've got five fingers. So the first one is connecting. The second one is taking notice. Oh. I was thinking, taking notice, I didn't think was the second one. The second one was being active. <laughs> See, I'm testing you. The third one was taking notice. The fourth one was <laughs> learning. And the fifth one was giving. giving. Excellent. OK, so thank you ever so much for coming today. I hope you've really enjoyed it. Um, with Please... Um, fill in your feedback forms that will be on the website at the end of today. Um, we might be really mean and make sure that you can't download any of the talks until you've completed your feedback forms. Um, and then we can begin to think about doing another conference. All right. Thanks ever so much.